Good evening and welcome to the College of Charleston virtual open house. I'm Devin Thompson, Senior Associate Director for Admissions Events, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's open house. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all and thanks for joining us. We know that navigating the college application and search process can be a little tricky in general, but especially during this time of COVID-19. And you're probably asking what's next? Well, we hope that tonight's event will further your interest in the College of Charleston and make us your next, the next step in your education and the next step in your future. Tonight's virtual open house is the third in our series, and it will focus on the academic experience of the College of Charleston. We have a fantastic evening set up for you. We're gonna start with a faculty panel with some of our esteemed faculty members, followed by an admissions overview led by one of our admissions counselors, and we'll conclude with a student panel of current students. We have a lot of information to cover tonight and a lot of great questions. You've probably pre-submitted some questions when you've received your e to the event, but if you have a question that comes up that isn't covered, feel free to submit it in the chat function of the Teams app. You'll see this in the right side of your app. Or if you think of something after the event concludes, email us at admissionsevents at cfc.edu. Like I said, we have a ton to cover tonight, so let's get started. I'm now gonna hand it over to Lee Meadows McAlpin, Assistant Director for Visitor Services at the College of Charleston. Lee? Lee, I think your mic is muted. Thank you. This is Lee, and we are excited to have you all here with us tonight. I wanted to take a minute and introduce our faculty panelists. We have Sebastian Van Delden, who is Interim Dean of the School of Sciences and Mathematics. We have James Neward, Newhart, excuse me, Director for the Center of Historical Landscapes and School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs. We also are happy to have Devin Hanahan, Faculty Marshal and Basic Language Program Coordinator, Spanish Language Program Coordinator and Depart in the Department of Hispanic St Studies within the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs. We also have Roxanne Stalvey, Associate Chair for the Department of Computer Science, School of Sciences and Mathematics. We have Stephen Litvin, Professor of Hospitality and Tourism Management within the School of Business. We also have Beth Meyer Bernstein, who is the Interim Dean of the Honors College and a uh, biology professor as well. Beatri Beatrice Maldonado, is Associate Professor in Economics and International Studies within the School of Business, and she works in the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs as well. So that rounds out our panel, and we'll dive right into some questions. As we go, if you have any uh, questions that you would like to contribute, please do so in the chat feature, and we will uh, touch on those as we wrap things up. Thanks. So our first question is uh, going to be answered first by Roxanne Stalvey. The question is, as students transition from high school class settings to college courses, what are some striking differences between high school and college that they should know? And what is one tip that you can give students to successfully transition from high school to college academics? Hey, it's so nice to be with y'all today. As they said, I'm Roxanne Stalby from the Department of Computer Science. Um, this is a great question. I absolutely love teaching incoming freshmen and do so often. And one thing that I find is that sometimes freshmen believe that there are gonna be lots of second chances. Like in high school, sometimes you're given opportunities to retake a test or redo an assignment. And those second chances don't come as much in college. Another thing that I think sometimes students don't always treat the college experience like it's a job. It's a fun, fun job, but college is still a job. So you want to take time out of your schedule to really spend time with your studies. My big piece of advice for incoming freshmen, don't take too heavy of a first semester workload. There are so many things that you have to learn as a new student just even how to do the laundry where even is the laundry um, that you need to take that into consideration when building your starting schedule and save time for friends and for exercise because those are going to make you a stronger student as well 
Thanks. Thank you, Roxanne. Devin, did you want to contribute as well? I'm hello. Thank you for having me here tonight, everybody. I'm an, uh, an alumna of the college as well, so I've been in your shoes or your potential shoes. I agree with Roxanne and not an hour ago, I was with one of my freshmen and I said, you need to teach, treat college like a job. You need to be professional. You need to be organized. Um, you know, yes, of course, it's your first year. You're going to get confused at times and make mistakes, but you are surrounded with people who can get you on the right track. My number one tip is be organized. Have a planner. Organize and block your time out. And as uh, Professor Stalby said, block out time for academics because they come first, but also block out time for sleeping, exercising, and relaxing so that you don't burn out. Thank you. Anyone else like to contribute on this question? I would like to contribute, Lee, if that's okay. Please do, Beth. Thanks. Hi, students. My name is Beth Meyer Bernstein. As, I, as Lee said, I'm the interim dean of the Honors College, and thanks for, for being here tonight, and we're excited um, that you're choosing, or at least thinking about choosing the College of Charleston. One of the things that I would add um, to, I guess, as a tip for, for students starting in college is to um, find your person or your people that can be your support group when you get to college. When you're in high school, you have your family, you have your friends that you've been with, um, you know, maybe even for 12 years. And when you move into a new environment, it's important that you at least find that one person who can be your support person. That could be a student in your dorm, that could be your faculty advisor, that could be someone in a club. Um, it, it doesn't really matter who it is, but just to have someone there um, so that you can um, have some support while you're starting this new job and, and working on all your studies. I, I, I would just highly suggest that. Smart advice, thank you. So let's move on to the next question. We, um, Sebastian, you may want to take this one. What do you expect of your students once they arrive on campus and get rolling with classwork? Uh, th thanks, Lee. Yeah, I think the yeah, second question is about the um, about the liberal arts education at the College of Charleston. And but before I, I dive into the answer to that, I wanted to do some sa uh, shameless self promotion here. So I'm the dean of the School of Sciences and Math. And every Friday at 3:30 from now till Thanksgiving, I do an in-person tour of our STEM buildings here at the College of Charleston. Would love for you to sign up and come visit with me in person and see me uh, any Friday at 3.30. You can sign up uh, just via the College of Charleston's event registration website. And my name is Sebastian. I think there's only one Sebastian who works at the College of Charleston, so I'm super easy to find. If you just Google Sebastian and CFC, I hope you reach out to me. Come join me on one of my in-person tours and uh, email me if you have any questions about any of our STEM majors. So one of the neat things about the College of Charleston is that it doesn't matter what your major is, you will have to take a, a broad based core liberal arts uh, education group of courses. And unlike your major, your major is preparing you for that first job out of college or to get into that graduate school of your choice. But the liberal arts education is going to prepare you for a career and a lifetime of achievement. And it doesn't matter if your major is education and public health and business or Spanish or whatever, that liberal arts education is going to help you throughout your entire life. To give you one example, the newest major at the College of Charleston is systems engineering. And the, the, the newest one starting next year is electrical engineering with a focus on autonomous electrical vehicles. These were designed, um, I was one of the folks helping to design these along with engineers from Boeing and Bosch and Volvo and Mercedes and all these big companies here in town. And they were fine with all the technical stuff in the curriculum, but the thing they really liked about our program was that liberal arts education so that our engineers would be able to work in these uh, collaborative, culturally diverse teams and not only solve the engineering problem, but solve it within that global context of manufacturing, which is so very important in this day and age. Back to you, Lee. Thank you. So uh, does anyone else have anything they'd like to contribute to that question? Um, yes, I, I would if I could. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Jim Newhart. I'm the director of the Center for Historical Landscapes here. And um, just to tag on to what uh, Sebastian was saying, 
uh, that, that liberal arts education gives you that kind of broader perspective of life and uh, the world around us. So I, I like to think of the major as, as giving you the, you know, some really good tools and techniques in terms of, of, of addressing a particular area of study, certainly. But the liberal arts is giving you that broader context of how it all folds together. Um, so majoring in, in accounting is great. The liberal arts gives you an understanding as to why that accounting matters um, by studying the humanities and the social sciences, studying uh, world cultures and systems, studying the natural world with the sciences and the mathematical sciences, giving us a good quantitative basis for analysis. All of those things roll in together and really help you contextualize why you are here on this planet. Um, so it's, a, it's an essential part of, I think, what we do here. Perfect. Thank you so much. Nice response. Moving on to question three. <clears throat> How much flexibility do students have in shaping their major or taking an interdisciplinary approach? Hi, I've got this one. Um, okay, thanks Beatrice. Uh, my name is uh, Beatrice Malzanato. I am a professor in both the economics department and international studies department. Um, and so uh, the second one of those two is a um, interdisciplinary program, uh, which is basically this idea of an interdisciplinary approach. And the, the major is quite flexible. Um, so you're able to take classes um, from uh, history, political science, anthropology, sociology, the languages, um, geographic area studies. Um, and this is just one example of um, this interdisciplinary idea that we have um, here at the college. Um, there are quite a few programs that are interdisciplinary in nature. Um, I'm also an affiliate with uh, Latin American and Caribbean studies. Um, also an interdisciplinary program, women and gender studies, um, even I think the environmental studies program, historic preservation, you name it, uh, programs that they see the possibility of, of making um, a better uh, uh, experience for our students by, you know, uh, allowing students to take classes from other departments or other schools. They definitely encourage that. So there is there is flexibility in that nature and, and we really encourage interdisciplinary where, wherever possible. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, question four. Let's see. Can you speak to the value and importance of your class syllabus? James, would you like yeah. to take this one? Yeah, I'm happy to, to speak about that. Uh, the syllabus is, is really, really important. Um, I think we spent, I, I know I spent a lot of time uh, crafting those documents because it's it's really um, giving you a, a roadmap as to how that class is going to be folding out throughout the entire semester. Uh, various policies in terms of uh, what kinds of things I expect from the students in terms of their assignments in terms and how those assignments are uh, going to be weighted for the final grade. Um, various policies in terms of uh, when you can contact me, how you can get in touch with me what types of assistance um, the institution provides uh, that might be helpful for this particular class. Um, there's a lot of information um, and a lot of things that I will in the syllabus, but also things that I will point to you is like, if you need help on this, go see this uh, office or, or these, or these uh, uh, people to help you out on, on particular issues. There's also um, on my syllabus, um, a, a course schedule and, and specific dates in terms of when things are due. So that syllabus is really, uh, really, really important in helping you plan and organize the semester. And in combination with the other courses, it will give you a, a broader roadmap in terms of how you're going to be successful in the semester. So if there's first step, if you have a question about what's happening in the class, the first step is always go to the syllabus. It's probably there someplace and if it's not, okay, yeah, then you're going to call me. But that that's a very vital document, um, certainly. Stephen, would you like to speak to the syllabus question about, as well? How about if instead of that, can I go back to uh, B's answer on the interdisciplinary? Absolutely. That'll, that'll mess up your program that I'm no not staying in order. But uh, I love B's answer. Uh, and she is classic interdisciplinary. One of the things that, that I would have uh, 
that I would recommend with the students interested in interdisciplinary is uh, you create your own. That uh, by the time you've done your general education requirements and most every major on campus, you still have time to add a minor to that. And adding the minor is a terrific way to have interdisciplinary. Again, I teach hospitality and tourism, and I have students every single semester who are adding a minor in Spanish and just know that's going to help them down the road career wise by doing it. And it's their interest or they add a uh, uh, I'm big into the tourism and impacts on communities and urban studies is just a terrific minor to add with it when you have the interest. Uh, so uh, it, it really comes back to a large degree back with that difference freshman and what do we need to do uh, advice for students all the time is uh, be smart in your planning when you get here as a freshman try to figure out what it is that you want to do take classes that let you explore different areas um, once you have a plan try to find it stick with it because uh, if you're going to work in a minor or two minors and it's not unusual for students to do that uh, the more you want to add to it the less flexibility you have within your 122 hours over four years if you start committing to more. But if you want to do that, it's an absolutely terrific way to create your own uh, your own academic experience. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate absolutely that. Absolutely perfect. Thank you so much for for adding that. So since we're playing hopscotch a little bit around with the questions, we're going to jump back to our um, our lineup and go to question uh, five, which is what attributes do you find the most successful students in the classroom at the college possess? So Devin, would you like to take this one? Yes, um, there are you're going to meet so many different kinds of students at the college, uh, which is one of the great things about it. But I would say the attributes that are the most important are a being a hard worker. I always I've taught for 30 years and it's the hardworking students rather than the, you know, National Merit Scholar students who are very successful in the classroom. So that's on the academic side, hard work and organization. Um, be organized, be organized. But I also find two sort of less um, stringent sounding adjectives are be flexible. I agree with Dr. Litvin in that what you know, once you make a plan, stick with it, but Students who are willing to try different clubs, different classes, uh, and so on are, um, I came in as a math major and ended up as a Spanish major. So that's, that's a long story, but that's just one example. Um, be flexible and be enthusiastic and see the best in others. Everybody on this campus is on your side. Everybody in this campus is doing something to enhance your experience. So recognize that and and be, be glad of that. And and so to sum it up, work hard, be organized, be flexible as you're being now with the coronavirus. We all have to be flexible and be enthusiastic and joyful. Enjoy every second. When I was a student, I worked two jobs. But I always took as many classes as I could because I just wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. I joined every club I had time to do. Um, I really do think these are for the greatest years of your life. So, so come at them hard. Great. Thank you, Devin. So Roxanne, do you, you have anything you wanted to add? So I think Devin's advice is it's spot on. Professor Hanahan really touched on a lot of things that I want to say. One of my biggest piece of advice for the students that I found that are really successful in my class is that they do keep a calendar. So just like Professor Hanahan said that they really do a lot to stay organized. I know it's tough and it's one of the things you have to learn to 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 do as a freshman. Um, I also think that the students who've done really well are the students that get started on their assignments as soon as they're assigned. It's OK to be a procrastinator in sometimes, but in academics, it sometimes really puts you behind the eight ball in your other classes. So if you procrastinate in one class and now you're forced to, to procrastinate in others, and so it has this really negative snowball effect. 
Another thing that I think some of my best students have done is that they attend all lectures. And I don't mean that they're just there kind of sleeping and hanging out. No way, they're there, they're listening, they're participating, they are a part of lecture. And they're one of the things that make lecturing so much fun for us as faculty. Um, and then the other thing that I think that some of my best students have done is that they make time in their lives for life's extras. There are so many opportunities on the college campus, just like Professor Hanahan mentioned. And if you can take advantage of those opportunities, if you can reach out and do extra things, it might be things within your major that you're interested in, clubs that you're interested in participating within your field of study, or they might be things completely different like like maybe um, spending time just in the library reading books or, or, or hanging out on the college green. Just making time for college's extras is going to give you that reboot that you need to stay a strong student. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much. That's great. So rolling on to the next question. Uh, here at CFC, we offer research opportunities to all of our students. What unique undergraduate research opportunities are available to students? And can you tell us about one of your favorite research projects you worked with students on? So I can answer that, Lee. This is Beth Thank you, Beth. again. Thank um, you. So, so I also um, was the director of the undergraduate research and creative activities office on campus. And so that's just kind of the first thing I want to say is that the college is really committed to providing these opportunities for students. And so we have a dedicated office on campus. There are some of the schools on campus, including the School of Science and Math, has also dedicated funds to support undergraduate research. And one of the great things about coming to a place like the College of Charleston is you can actually engage in undergraduate, undergraduate research early on. So in some big schools, you might not be able to engage with a faculty and one-on-one -on -one mentored research till you're maybe a junior or even a senior. Where at the College of Charleston, you can engage your second semester, your freshman year, your first summer if you want, and that the faculty are really, really excited to work with you as students. We don't have um, any PhD programs currently. We have some master's programs, but most of our faculty work with undergraduate students. And so we are excited to work with you as students. And so um, it's, it's sometimes can be intimidating to, to reach out for a faculty to see if, you're, if they have opportunities to work with them. But at the College of Charleston, it's really easy. And we try to make that as easy as possible for you because we're really interested in working with students. So we have research opportunities across the entire campus. So that's another point that I wanna make is that it's, when we talk about undergraduate research, it's undergraduate research in creative activities. So creating new knowledge um, in the, whatever discipline that you're working in. So that's not only in a chemistry lab, but that's also in an art studio. That's also in the School of Business. That's also in the School of Languages and in in English department. You can see this creation of new knowledge in all different disciplines. And as we've talked a lot about tonight, a lot of interdisciplinary work is also done on campus. And so really the opportunities are here for you to pursue. And so we have them on campus, but we also have some in the community as well. So for those of you who are interested in, in science and medicine, the medical school is just down the street, the Medical University of South Carolina. And quite a few of our students in the sciences will do undergraduate research in their labs and they'll get credit for it as well as if you would do it on campus. So there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of emphasis on that type of experiential learning here on campus. So one of my favorite research projects that I worked on um, was actually an interdisciplinary project. So my background is in neuroscience. So most of the work that I've done in my lab has been on studying biological clocks and I love working with students and so I've had a lot of students that I've mentored in that capacity but I had a student who was a neuroscience student and he was also interested in business and neuromarketing and really the intersection of neuroscience and business and so he did this project um, where, he, where he had two mentors it was myself and then also at that time uh, uh, the chair of, of um, Econ, I guess, uh, Calvin Blackwell in the School of Business. 
And the project was, was analyzing the effect of pro-social behavior, in this case, hugging, on this game called, the, uh, it's a computer game called Joy of Destruction. Now, I don't know much about the Joy of Destruction, but apparently this computer game, you can take money away from other people or not. And so when you hug someone, you have an increase in the hormone oxytocin, our little love chemical, right? And so the, the study that he did was to see if hugging prior to playing this computer game changed the behavior of the students playing the game. And it ends up that it did change the behavior and they, they actually published that research in a, in a peer reviewed journal. So that was my favorite project because it was something that was out of my discipline and um, it was an interdisciplinary disciplinary project where I got to learn something new as well. Fascinating. Lee, can I can I add to what Beth said in her amazing answer? Um, you may. I, I just want to bring this up because it actually kind of reflects the question about interdisciplinary uh, approaches that uh, Beth just alluded to. But I also want to let students know that I had a student um, create an independent study when we were abroad in Spain. And she combined her love of Spanish with her uh, other major in urban planning. She was also in the Honors College. And she did a project. She, she created the proposal, did the research while we were in Spain. It ended up that she did, we set up a presentation for her to give, not just to the College of Charleston, but to the city of Charleston. It was a public event. It led to her getting a job with the Preservation Society of the College of Charleston, um, and then on to a Fulbright. And this girl is going to end up uh, leading the National Trust one day. It's basically created her career, and she's considered a rock star in this town in Spain where she did all the research because it's bringing attention and funds to their preservation. So I just wanted to give that as an example of where this student at, a, at an early age, probably her sophomore year, came up with this idea and found the means to do this research. So even overseas, you can do it. Lee, can and I just add a, yes, can I add a quick one more to it? Yes, and then we have two more with their hands raised as well. So oh, I'm don't, sorry. I should have uh, been no, more polite. That's okay. You go first and then we'll it's jump to the others. It's a it's popular, popular question. Uh, Indeed. Can, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dean, Meyer Bernstein, made the comment emphatically, but it, it just has to be said again. Coming to the College of Charleston, one of the reasons you're, you will be attracted here really is our lack of, of a PhD program. It makes us different in a way. We're all here teaching because we really enjoy working with undergraduate students. Go to just down the road, University of South Carolina, the professors, my colleagues there, they don't work with undergraduate students. They got classes of 300 people. They don't necessarily know the students and their research that they do, they're going to do with their PhD students. They're not going to do with undergraduate students. I've probably published uh, 20 to 25 articles with College of Charleston undergraduate co-authors. How cool is that to graduate and be a published author? But I reach out to the kids. Uh, I, I had a student last semester, I had, she was reviewing a journal article and it was one that I had written about the bridge run here in Charleston, second largest uh, 10K in the country. And I was very critical of it saying it's pretty, it's not a positive, they're holding it out. She was critical of my work. She didn't believe it was right. And at the end of it, I said, uh, okay, next bridge run, let's replicate my work and see uh, see what's right on it. Um, and it's just, there are tremendous opportunities for it that I'm working with uh, two undergrads now. We started their freshman, uh, freshman year. They're now sophomores <laughs> working with the police department. They've got every drunk driving, uh, every drunk driving citation given in the city over the last year. And we're analyzing who the drunk drivers are, where they're caught, what we need to do. And it's part of the hospitality saying, what do we have to do to train people better not to have that happen? So good custom, good uh, community service. And I guarantee these kids will end up getting, being published at the end. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, so I'm going to pass this question to two other faculty members and then we'll move on to the next question. I hope that one thing that is coming across loud and clear is that our faculty really do enjoy working with students. 
uh, whether it's on re research projects or uh, just in the classroom. But for um, a further response on this question, James, are you, uh, Jim, are you willing to jump in? Certainly, I'll, I'll chip in. Uh, just okay. as another example, one of the uh, opportunities, the uh, undergraduate research I had a couple of years ago, we were uh, 3D scanning the linear B tablets from the Palace of Nestor and Pilos, which is a, an archaeological Mycenaean archaeological site in Greece, dates about 1300 BC. But these tablets are basically a national treasure for uh, the, the modern uh, state of Greece. And we uh, were in uh, there to basically document them, scan them in three dimensions in high uh, resolution imagery. And we needed a student assistant to help us develop this kind of new technique of, of uh, 3D scanning, um, which, you know, 10 years ago was a, was a new thing for us. Um, so uh, picked a, a, a freshman who had been had a great year in, uh, in our courses and was interested in, in archaeology as a profession. And uh, that summer she went on, a, got on a plane and she was uh, in the basement of the National Archaeological Museum of Athens for a couple of seasons working with us. And actually she developed the methods for uh, laser or for white light scanning uh, these objects in 3D, which meant that she had to go to the national conference and give a presentation. Um, and as she uh, gave her presentation, one of the individuals came up to her and saw this, thought it was fascinating, and asked if she was a first year or a second year graduate student. Um, she replied that she was a sophomore and uh, the individual's mouth dropped. And all I had to say was, you know, College of Charleston, you know, that's what we do here. Um, so a lot of really great experiences uh, here for students, uh, whether you're, uh, and, you know, there are plenty of opportunities at every stage of, I think, of a person's uh, undergraduate career to get engaged. Well said, thank you. Sebastian, what would you like to add? Uh, yeah, we all want to uh, jump in on this question because we all love, with, <laughs> all love working with students on research projects. So a couple of um, areas across campus I know of paleontology. Last night on my way home, I got to call my wife and say I helped move a five foot tri triceratops head into our building. I mean, how cool is that? We have faculty doing work with the prevalence, understand the prevalence of microplastics here in the community. We have a one of a kind program in the US that does seafloor mapping off the coast. We do tiger shark tagging. If you're into cybersecurity, we have students set up honey pots to track hackers. We do different types of plant genetics works. We have one of the foremost top scientists in the world that studies black holes. And my personal, my last project I worked on with a student, we wrote a system where we could talk to a drone and give it voice commands and have it uh, fly around. And she, we published a paper and that she went to Austria to present that paper and we paid for her to do that, which was very exciting. Very interesting. We, Thank we, you. Yes. We, 10 seconds? Yes. Because we're killing this one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> All of this undergraduate research, one of the things that it leads to College of Charleston the last two years has been one of the top five uh, producers of Fulbright scholars that uh, we are terrific at getting students in the, the, it, as Fulbrights. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's incredibly impressive. Devin mentioned one of her students had, a, had earned a Fulbright. And I am convinced that one of the reasons our students are so successful is because we engage them in undergrad in research while they're still undergrads. Very good. Thank you for adding that. We're going to move on to the next question quickly, and I'm going to read it out and let uh, I think that James, are you uh, ready to prepare to answer this next one, which is what other opportunities outside of your class do you encourage students to get involved in? For example, suggested minors, uh, student organizations, internships, Volunteer opportunities, competitions, etc. I know the options are endless. Well, I, I think undergraduate research is one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> um, but no, there, I, I encourage students to, to get engaged in, um, you know, the, I think Devin said this is, you know, a, a, you know, a really great part of your life um, and a, a very special time of your life. So, really getting engaged in um, student organizations um, and clubs is a great way to, to really see how your future and your your work life balance um, is going to work out uh, in the long term. Um, you know, one of the question part of the questions here is about internships and volunteer opportunities, um, competitions. 
these can be tied and rolled into um, your major or minor or maybe some sort of uh, career direction that you're thinking of. Um, a lot of people who, let's say, might be majoring in a, a traditional um, humanities degree that doesn't have a, a direct track into a career. Um, internships and volunteer opportunities are ways in which you can kind of transfer your knowledge of uh, English or philosophy or classical studies into um, and see how that evolves into a, a career opportunity uh, down the line. So certainly um, academics are essential and critical. Um, but these other types of opportunities are, are really, really important and, and essential as well. Very good. Anyone want to add anything to that? I would like to just add study abroad if you can. Go abroad, see the world, and get an opportunity to tie in your interest at, here at the college with what they're doing around the world. It'll make you a, it'll make you a more global student. I concur. Good, good addition there. So moving on to the next question, how do you encourage or motivate your students to engage in your class? Devin, you're probably well prepared to answer this one. Well, yes, because in a language class, it's all about talking to each other and being engaged. And, and really, my answer applies to both the traditional face to face class and to this new world we're in of Zoom and hybrids and so on. Um, but I, I definitely see my students as, as multidimensional. You are my students. Um, I, I'm gonna make you work hard. I'm gonna teach you as much as I can, as much as you're willing to learn, but you're also a human being. And it's really important for professors to remember that and for students to remember that about their professors as well. So what I do is I, I first explain to students, you know, where we're going this semester and as, uh, Jim said earlier, the syllabus, I remember years ago, a student saying, gosh, I just wish I had like a list of things I could do to be successful in this class. And I was like, gosh, I wish you did too. Oh, wait, I do. It's a syllabus. So anyway, I, I do uh, let you know what I expect of you. Um, I personally, in a language class, I never have more than 22 people, which is a luxury for some teachers. But I personally keep track of all of my students and I do not let a class go by where I have not spoken one on one with all 22 of those students. It might be extensive. It might be just a quick, you know, some quick uh, base touching, but it's always there. So when the students know that they're not anonymous in my class, then that makes a big difference for them to engage. And also I remind them of their successes. I say things like you couldn't have done this two weeks ago. Look what you can do. You're expressing your opinion about the environment using this very sophisticated language. This was something I said today. Um, so I, I encourage them by reminding them of their successes of how much potential they have. Um, on the personal level, I uh, always invite students all semester long to share their talents and skills. My, I tend to teach in the same classroom every semester. My walls are covered with art that students have brought me, nothing to do with Spanish. I've had students sing and play guitar in class before. I've had students show videos of themselves climbing rocks, training dogs, fixing cars. So what I do is I try to remind, I, I try to let the student know, and, and I think Steve said this early, Stephen said this earlier, is that at the College of Charleston, you really are not a number. You really are an individual that we recognize. And that more than anything, motivates our students. You're not going to fall through the cracks if we can help it because we see you. We see you right there and um, and that can be daunting because we're not going to let you get away with not doing your work, but it's encouraging because um, you, you know, you're a person to us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, anyone have anything they'd like to add to this question? All right. So if a student is struggling, how what do you recommend that they do? James, are you able to help with this one? Yeah, uh, come and see me. See your professor. <laughs> um, Don't be a stranger. Yeah, exactly. As, De as Devin says, uh, we are interested in your success and uh, we are uh, we're in your corner. Um, so I think if someone is struggling, the, the first step in, in a class, your first step is to to the instructor. Um, and, you know, come and see us. Um, maybe there's something to help or there's uh, an office or some other 
uh, place on campus where we can direct you to uh, to assistance with writing or with uh, with mathematics or other types of support systems. But um, engaging with your instructor, engaging with your professors, um, it's it's that's a, a critical success element. Very important. Very true. I uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Am I am I muted there? No, Not at I, all. Go but ahead. I also Steven. think it's uh, it just as a quick point worth stating that. Uh, Again, we're lauding the way we do things at the College of Charleston, but one of the things that is very, very different from uh, from other school, from many other schools, and as you're looking at the college, what you're going to see real quickly is we're a big school with 10,000 students that feels like a small school, and we're a public school that very, very much feels like a private school. Uh, and really a different different that way. And one of the things you're going to find different is as a freshman, you'll get an advisor in academic advising, declare a major and you'll get an advisor within your major. So absolutely, James, go visit your professor, but uh, but don't be a stranger from your advisor. Uh, go get somebody and you can get a lot of help from faculty that uh, that will sit with you. And again, at college, uh, that's part of our job and we enjoy doing it and interacting with students at, uh, at many of the large research oriented schools. You would never get to meet your faculty, have a faculty advisor. Um, it's really important. Thank you. Very good. In terms of preparing students for a career after college, how do you recommend they prepare themselves to make the most of their time? at the College of Charleston. Uh, Beth, you want to lead off with this one? Sure, absolutely, Lee. Sorry, Thank I had, you. To, had to unmute myself for a second. <laughs> so um, I think the first thing that you need to do is kind of explore, you know, come to college and kind of explore your areas of interest. So you might come in thinking you're going to do one thing, but if you have kind of a, a singular mindset, you may you may overlook what could be a, a very interesting potential career. So I think the first thing to do is just kind of come in with an open mind and, and take classes that are interesting. Try to think about how you could maybe have a career in one of those things, one of those interests one day think about what courses are interesting to you, maybe do a little research on some careers. Um, and the way uh, uh, the, the resources that can help you here really lie at uh, our career center. So our career center, um, in addition to the faculty and your advisors and everyone that we've kind of already spoken about, we haven't spent too much time talking about their role and how they can help you while you're at the College of Charleston. So they're a wonderful resource. Um, and you can start working with them their, your freshman year as soon as you step on campus. They have programs on how to figure out what your major is, how to align your interests and your skills with a career down the down the road. They have people that come in all the time and talk about um, what career opportunity opportunities lie ahead. So I think the first thing to do is explore your areas of interest. And then what you need to do is really kind of start planning. So how can you get to point B from point A, right? And so again, the Career Center can help you with this. Your faculty, your advisors can help you with this, but also you need to sit down and make a plan. And so we've talked a lot about having your um, calendar for the semester, but what I would recommend is you put together a calendar for your four years while you're here at the College of Charleston. So that way you can get things into your schedule like study abroad and your exercise, whatever you need to do, other types of activities, but you have this long-term goal. Now, what you don't need to do is stick to that goal all the time because that goal may change. But as long as you have a plan, even if you change that plan, then that's that's a, a good way also to, to um, kind of secure your, your trajectory so that you feel like everything you're doing is leading to that point B. And then you need to do a lot of what we've been talking about tonight, which is really kind of practice what those potential careers would be. So internships, undergraduate research, those types of experiential learning activities, those are gonna give you not only a taste of what that career could look like, and you might decide you want to do it, or you might decide you don't want to do it, and either of those conclusions are right, but it also gives you some experience to then 
uh, go to a future employer or future graduate school and you already have some understanding um, of that particular career. So I think those three things, so explore what your options may be, really a plan for those uh, making the most of those four years while you're here and integrate all of your activities into your long-term goal and then practice what that career would be like. Very good, thank you. James, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I would just simply say that um, everything that, that, that's just been said is, is spot on. Um, but really, one of the questions I ask incoming freshmen, if, if they're declaring a major in classics, for example, which is what, you know my home department is, um, you know, I'll ask them, what, what, do you, what do you want to do after four years? Where are you heading? Um, because we want to be in a position to help that individual move from where they're at right now through the four years into that uh, particular uh, position. So leveraging our, our alumni base, um, and bringing in other types of opportunities, internships and research experiences. It's really a conversation that we like to have one on one with the students to uh, basically kind of help them plan out the, their, their four years. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a transitionary period really that these four years of, of, of moving into that, into that world of, uh, of whatever uh, possibilities uh, they're thinking of. Lee, if I, if I could just add real quickly on Please top do. of that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I've heard said, and I love it, for kids, come, students coming in uh, the line saying, for the next four years, the cost of your education is fixed. You're going to pay the tuition. You're going to pay the housing. You're going to pay the books. The cost is fixed. Um, the return on that investment is totally variable. It's entirely up to you. So all these things are Asks are available for you to help get a better return. Join every club you can. I heard that before. You'll meet people that's going to have a return on investment for you. Get to know your faculty. Sure, we said about doing undergraduate research. We all agree, except I bet 90% of it starts with the student making the introduction and the effort rather than the faculty necessarily going and knocking on a student's door and say, why don't you work with me? Uh, you want to get a good return? We want to help you uh, make the investment. And uh, College of Charleston is a great place to get a, a mega return on that investment. Absolutely. I love this next question. What is your favorite part of teaching at the College of Charleston and why? Roxanne, you want to take this one? I'll definitely start off. Thanks. So I, I absolutely love our location. I love the fact that we're liberal arts, but I love most about the College of Charleston is our students. I like the energy they bring to the co College of Charleston. I like the energy they bring to their to the to the classroom and to our clubs and to the organization. I also like the realness of our students. I feel like the students on the College of Charleston campus don't ask each other to conform to their beliefs, to their way of life, to the way they dress. I feel like everybody is an individual and is treated like an individual and respected for their individuality. And I also really love walking through the college and kind of listening to the students and seeing the beauty of the campus, of course, but, but seeing the joy that our students seem to have on their faces and, and their expressions kind of of happiness as they're walking from point A to point B. It brings me a lot of pleasure and I love the resilience and the positivity of our student body. I think we have some of the best students in the country and in the world. So thanks. That, that's absolutely the truth. Anyone want to add to this question? Ditto to everything Roxanne said. <laughs> yeah, um, I would I would also add that I, I this is a Goldilocks size of an institution in my mind in that um, we're big enough so that we can do some really interesting uh, research oriented projects um, and and really think about some some big things and and accomplish those big things. We're small enough though that if I wanted, for example, do a, a major archaeological project, 
um, I have to engage with my colleagues in the geological sciences and the anthropological uh, and the anthropology department. Um, I have to, I am in some ways encouraged to collaborate with uh, other people in other departments. Um, so it really brings on a very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary vibe to, uh, to the work we do. And so uh, for me, innovation happens at those intersections between the disciplines and the, the size of this institution allows us and encourages us to reach out to other programs and other ways of thinking, um, but yet gives us a certain amount of scale so that um, those the, that research and that education, I think, is, is really meaningful and deep and penetrating. Both good answers. Thank you so much. In, yes. in one sentence, I love that I've got uh, classes of 30 students where I know every student's name. I know who the students are, where they're from. Uh, my previous school, my classes were 300 students and I didn't know any of them. Uh, it's really, really special. And uh, I think that's part one of the things we all love about being here. Very, very good, very true. So we're gonna move into a couple of questions from the chat. So thank you students for submitting questions to the chat and comments and uh, et cetera. And so we'll work our way through them, but we're just gonna start with two for the faculty panel and then we'll address some of the other questions later in the uh, presentations. Um, the first one is for our faculty, our, and, and this has been touched on uh, with the earlier question, but it is, are students encouraged to be a part of research starting freshman year? Do you want me to take that, Lee? Go ahead, sounds great. So it depends. I think not the first semester because that first semester, you're gonna need to get settled. You're gonna need to acclimate to the new environment. You're gonna need to acclimate to your, new, your academics. Um, your second semester, it's possible. Um, I think, you know, I'm not sure that the that faculty would, you know, strongly encourage people to start their second semester, but there's quite a few students who are ready to start their second semester. And so we will work with you to, to help make that happen. It also depends on the discipline that you're interested in pursuing. So um, some disciplines might require some coursework before you start engaging in that undergraduate research opportunity. So I think those opportunities are there, maybe starting your spring of your, your um, freshman year, definitely a lot of students pursue research that first summer. So um, as the director of the, or previous director of the Office of Undergraduate Research, um, we had a lot of students who would do research that first summer. So they've already made those connections their first fall. The grants are due in early February, already submitted one. So they've got, they're, they're already rolling in that first summer. So I think it depends, it's possible, not your first semester though. Very good. Anyone would like to, if, would anyone like to add anything to this question? All right, so we're going to move on to the second question from chat and then we'll wrap things up uh, and move on to the next segment. So as a professor, what do you value in interacting with first year students? Who would like I, to take that? Well, I, Roxanne and I both said this earlier. I adore working with freshmen. I'm an ex high school teacher. I love high school students. And um, I'd say what I appreciate most. I don't want to say tabula rasa because you have a lot of experience, but I love seeing you grow. Um, I love having a student who um, is willing to be vulnerable and ask questions and ask for help when needed, but who balances that with the desire for independence. And let's face it, you're all at an age, I've raised two sons, where you're ready for some independence. And so I really, I really value being part of that balance between um, be becoming independent, um, but also exploring opportunities and areas for help. I, I love seeing my freshmen from August to December. They're just, they're just completely different in that short time. And it's so, it's so much fun and I never get tired of seeing it. Thank you. At this point, I think we're ready to wrap up the faculty panel for portion and send it on to, Devin, do I send it to you or to Fred? 
Sure, thank you, Lee, and thank you, faculty members. I know that as an alumna um, and current employee of the college, I have just always loved the support that our faculty members provide our students, and it's such a joy to still see that be the case. Um, so thank, thank you, faculty, for joining us tonight. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Fred Quick. Um, Fred is our Assistant Director for Admissions, and he is going to lead you all in an admissions overview, answer some of those hard hitting questions you've been submitting in the chat about test optional, about applying to the Honors College, um, all these great questions. So Fred, take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Devin. How's everyone doing? My name is Fred Quick. Um, I'm the admissions counselor for the Deep South, so everything from Georgia to Louisiana. And I'm excited to be joining you tonight to talk to you about the College of Charleston. Um, the best thing about presenting now is that you all got a chance to hear directly from our professors. Um, and this gives you really an idea of the campus and what our campus can provide for you. Now, to give you a brief overview of the college, we here at the College of Charleston are a public liberal arts and science university. Um, with everything our professors are able to share, I hope you have a grasp of what liberal arts actually means for you, specifically here at the College of Charleston. But we're just under 10,000 students. Uh, we have an average class size of about 23 and a student faculty ratio of about 16 to 1. So although we're 10,000 students, a medium-sized college, able to be large enough to offer, offer over 140 different majors and minors, to be able to have over 240 clubs and organizations, to offer study abroad to 65 different countries and territories. We are also small enough to still be able to have professors who are here because they want to teach, because they want to engage with you. They want to see you have those aha moments and to help you along your way through experiential learning. What I really want to focus on in this slide, though, um, is really quickly talk about our student organizations and our top five majors. So in our student organizations, um, we have everything from clubs that are here just to help you find that community and be surrounded by people who love the same things that you love. So if that means you Harry Potter fans who love Quidditch and you want to jump on a broomstick and run around our library chasing snitches and throwing balls in the hoops, you're more than welcome to do so. Or if you are interested in joining the micro the microeconomics club. Or if you're looking for things that can help you advance your career while also being surrounded by people. Because here what we believe is that your learning doesn't stop when the school bell rings, nor does nor should it be confined to what you can gain from one person in the confines of four walls. So your learning really is an extension and our campus in the city of Charleston is an extension of your learning playground. Um, here at the College of Charleston, our, lar our five largest majors are in biology, psychology, business administration, communication, and public health. And as we move forward, what we'll see is that the reason these five majors are most popular are because of what our city has to offer. So on this next slide, what you will see is actually um, what's right here in the city of Charleston. Our professors touched on it, um, specifically Dr. Van Delden, but what you're able to see here is Boeing. Boeing is a large producer of airplanes in the world. They build planes in literally two locations, Seattle, Washington, and Charleston, South Carolina. Um, moving Moving here, you also see Mercedes-Benz, BMW, uh, Volvo, uh, Google, Blackbot, Sparrow, literally you name it, all in Charleston. I'm not just, not just mentioning these because they happen to be in Charleston and we happen to be in Charleston. They all have vested interest in the growth and what the College of Charleston can produce and provide for them. Through this liberal arts education, you're able to have a focus in the sciences or have a focus in business, but also have a liberal arts perspective. So you get that well-rounded experience that creates those invaluable skill sets that you can bring to the work. Um, another thing to point out here is also the Medical University of South Carolina, which is only four blocks away from our campus. So literally four blocks away, you have the oldest medical school in the South. CUC is the oldest school in the South. Uh, literally this year, we celebrated our 250th year as an institution, while the city of Charleston celebrated 350 years. So this historic town known for food and art is also doing a lot of great innovative and vibrant things. And four blocks away, you have a medical university of about 4,000 students and a network of hospitals of about 16,000 employees. So you as a student have access to not only our great faculty here at the college, but also to the opportunities available at the medical university. So as we move on, I don't want to talk to you about just what all you can accomplish here, but also I want to talk to you about getting here. So our application this year, we've gone test optional um, for the fall. And I know that brings a lot of uncertainty to, uncertainty to you guys about what exactly does test optional mean. 
But when you submit your application, whether you submit it online through our application portal or through the Common App, all you need to submit is your online application, complete that, and submit your high school transcript. Now, next, test um, our application deadlines. So getting here, for all the students that are looking to apply, if CFC is your top choice and you can't see yourself going anywhere else in the world, no matter what, by October 15th, if you apply, you have your parents and your school counselor um, sign, letting us know that you know that this is a binding decision. You'll receive your decision back by December 1st and we'll expect you to be prepared to deposit by January 1st to join the best school you could ever make the choice to attend. Um, the other deadlines on this slide that really stand out are gonna be early action, which is December 1st, along with uh, our regular notification deadline of February 15th. Our honors college priority deadline is also December 1st, and you're gonna be in consideration for merit-based scholarships as long as you have your application in by uh, February 15th. Now on this slide, you see that it says we are test optional. Um, as we move to the next slide, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about what test optional means. So this year, for all of our students who are going to, not to say a traditional school, but uh, the only exceptions we have of students who need to submit their test scores are gonna be students who are homeschooled, who are self-paced, who are recipients of GEDs, or who are South Carolina residents who are gonna be eligible for South Carolina state scholarships. So for the life scholarships and the Palmetto Fellows, things of that sort, you will still need to submit your test scores there, but any other student, you're not required to submit your test scores. We're also test score optional for merit-based scholarships consideration. And just to kind of clear up some of the uncertainty there, if you submit your scores and you were to receive a higher merit-based scholarship with your scores not considered, we'll pretend we didn't see them for merit-based consideration. So just to kind of um, calm some of those worries, we'll move to the next slide and look at the profile of some of our accepted students. So last year, when we're talking about getting here, our middle 50% for last year's class for in-state students scored between about a 1060 to a 1230 and between about a 20 to a 27 on the ACT. For our out-of-state students, they score between about a 1080 to a 1230 and between about a 22 to a 28. Now, keep in mind, that's the middle 50%. So we still have 25% of our students above that and 25% of our students below that. The thing I really want you to take away from this slide is a competitive AB average. So there's a big range there of grades, but I don't, don't want you to be focused on numbers. I want you to just think of a competitive AB average. So what we like to see is that over the course of four years, essentially your maturation um, throughout high school. But we wanna see that you've challenged yourself and that you've been successful at it. So seeing from freshman year to senior year, it shows a story of how you develop your learning style, how you develop your study habits. Do you work well in group projects? Do you work and perform well in the classes that you love versus the classes that you don't really like, but you know you need? Those are gonna be some of the indicators that give us a better idea of the type of student you'll be in our classroom and how you'll perform while at the College of Charleston. We don't wanna hold a four hour scenario or a four hour test if you bubbling in the right answers as the ultimate be all of what your academic performance and your ceiling could be here at the College of Charleston. Now, for those students who are looking to apply, the next thing would be to talk about the Honors College. So our Honors College, simply put, it's not a punishment for smart kids being smart. Um, our Honors College literally is here to help students and provide them a bright community full of students who are highly motivated and high achieving. So you have that competitive um, environment, but not competitive in the sense of you only having or you're competing for the number one honors college spot. No, you're going to be surrounded by other students who are also high achieving, self-motivated and self-starters. So in our honors college, I mentioned that we don't want to punish you for being a smart and high achieving student. Only one third of your coursework is going to be done within the honors college. So it's here to assist you and help you along the way. Uh, we really encourage the sense of community within our honors college, which is why at the school, we have a 16 to 1 student faculty ratio, and the Honors College, it breaks down to about 11 to 1. We're really here because we want to see you gain success through our Honors College. Now, getting to the Honors College, our Honors College application. I've seen a lot of those questions in the chat, and so I want to talk to you briefly about it. Um, if you apply through the CFC application portal, if you go to the CFC website and you apply, all you do is select the Honors College tab, which I um, believe is the second tab on the page. It's usually a little yellow box. Select that and it'll take you through the steps of applying to the Honors College. If you use Common App, 
once you finish your common application, you'll receive an email with your information for creating your CFC applicant portal, which is going to be something that you need when it comes to checking your application status, making sure that all of your documents are received. So you receive that information, you'll sign up for your account, and you'll apply for the Honors College through our applicant portal. And in that, your Honors College application is also test score optional. Uh, they actually made a decision to go test score optional prior to uh, ACT sites um, canceling, which I guess this kind of threw away their big announcement. But anyway, um, <laughs> for uh, going for applying to the Honors College, what we really want to um, focus on is actually seeing you and showing the full story of you as a student. So we're going to ask for your application, an honors essay, a letter of recommendation from one of your core instructors, along with your resume. And you're able to go into the, app, uh, the applicant portal and as you submit all of those necessary documents, you'll see it checked off on the box. So you won't have any uncertainty of what you need um, from Honors College. Now, just really quickly to give you an idea of what an Honors College profile may look like, we have it right here where last year I met a 50% score between about 1310 to a 1420 and between about a 29 to a 32. Now, keep in mind one, we're a test for optional, but two, that's also uh, a middle 50%. So there are students above that and below that. It's not a numerical decision to get into the Honors College. We're looking at you holistically. So we want to make sure that we really stress that for our students. Now, moving on, once again, I really want to stress the um, guidelines for our test score optional. So students who choose to be test score optional, um, once again, those are students who are going to be homeschooled, who are GED um, applicants, as well as those students who are from the state of South Carolina looking to receive state funded scholarships. Um, our next slide will go into the financial aid and merit process. And I really want to stress that we are test score optional for merit consideration. Uh, we also have departmental scholarships, which while you're an applicant for the College of Charleston, if you're applying um, before the before the December 1st or the February 15th deadline, you can still apply for uh, for departmental scholarships. You will still technically be an applicant to the College of Charleston. You'll receive your decision in February, but you still can apply for departmental scholarships. And it's important that you get your departmental scholarships in uh, applications in by the January 15th deadline. We also offer alumni and athletic scholarships along with uh, federal and state aid. But once again, for merit-based scholarships, I really want to drive this home. We are test score optional. So you don't have to submit scores and you'll still be eligible for consideration for merit-based scholarships. And with that, my time here is done. And I want you to, um, if you want to get in touch with me for all of my uh, Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, Puerto Rico, and uh, other U.S. territory students. If you want to reach out to me, I'm almost always available. And you can find me on Instagram at CFC underscore Fred. Thank you, Thank you Brad. Brad. That was great. great. Sorry, I don't know why we have an echo going. Um, that was really helpful information, students. Hopefully that answered all the questions that you've been submitting around this year's changes in admissions policies. Um, but just a reminder, if we don't get to your questions, because we have so many coming in in the chat, y'all are amazing entering those in. Um, but if we don't get to your questions tonight during the live event, don't forget to email us at admissionsevents at cofc.edu. Uh, and we'll make sure to answer your questions promptly within the next day or two. All right, to our final event of the evening, let's get started with our student panel. I'm going to hand it over to Michelle McDowell. Uh, Michelle is our Senior Associate Director for Admissions and works um, with our in-state students, but tonight she is working with all of our fantastic current students moderating the student panel. So, Michelle? Great. Thank you, Devin. And again, thank you so much for being here. And we are, like Devin indicated, we are about at the end here, pulling this cougar train to the port. Um, but we want you to hear from our amazing students. You've heard from our wonderful faculty. Fred told you how you can get here. So now we're going to hear from our students who are living the CFC dream. So tonight we have with us um, Jack Golder, Lily Fair, pa Paul Savagayo, Destiny Hawkins, Jessica Beck, Cal Fersner and Courtney Smith. They're gonna tell you just a little bit more about themselves as they begin to answer their questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, our first question. What are the most popular majors at CFC 
And did you have a hard time choosing your major? Hi, everyone. I'll take that question. Um, my name is Jack Golder. I'm an honors sophomore from Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm majoring in public health and biology on a pre-med track. And our most popular majors, as we've seen before, they're going to be business, psychology, and biology. But the thing about the College of Charleston is that none of our majors are what makes the school. We have a wide variety of majors that all students choose from. And so your academic experience can be as unique as you are. And that's done through our interdisciplinary majors and minors. And so I came in as an elementary education major, still on that pre-med track. And I sat with my advisor and he was like, okay, this is what you have to do to accomplish it. And that's what all of our advisors want you to do. So they want you to find your passion and your major and whether that be double majoring, combining minors or any of that stuff. And you're going to find what you love and graduate with a degree that you can be successful with. Thank you, Jack. All right, let's move on to question number two. Are professors available outside of their offered office hours if you need extra assistance? Hi, so I'm Jessica Beck. Uh, I'm a junior from Hockington, Massachusetts, and I'm double majoring in political science and international studies. Um, for the most part, yes, professors are available outside of their offered, uh, offered office hours, but you would typically have to email them or talk with them to set up a time to meet with them. Um, it kind of depends on their schedule when they're able to meet with you and if they're able to help you with what you need. Um, depending on what you need help with, they may refer you to the uh, Center for Student Learning, which offers tutoring. So don't be scared if you get moved there instead of just meeting with your professor, but they're definitely available. You just have to make time to uh, talk with them and make sure that they are all set with what you need. Hey, thank you, Jessica. Our next question. Does your major require independent research or a capstone project? If not required, do students have those opportunities? Hi guys, I'm Courtney Smith. I'm a double major in communications and political science in the Honors College with a tentative minor in Spanish. We'll see how that goes. But um, with this, as a communications major, we do have a capstone project, which is kind of the focus of your senior year. You build up to that within your major, but also through the Honors College, you have a bachelor's essay. So that's another separate research project. So that kind of can um, be like interdisciplinary and something you can work on outside of that. But you definitely have the opportunity to do research, even if it's not something that's built into your major's track. I did a, I had a colloquium class, it was, it was based in history, and I got really interested in a topic and a professor reached out to me and was like, so is this something that you would want to do research on? You don't have to get credit for it. You can get credit for it. We can work it out. So it's really just depending on if you find something that you're passionate about. Our professors are so supportive and really, really want you to just cultivate that passion and really find a way to like use your skills to like the best of your abilities. Thank you, Courtney. Our next question. Is it a difficult transition from high school coursework to college coursework expectations? Uh, hi, I'll take this one. Uh, my name is Kyle Fersner. I am a sophomore here at the college majoring in elementary education and uh, I'm from Somerville, South Carolina. Um, the transition from high school coursework to college coursework, I'd say it's something to get used to. I wouldn't define it as difficult quite yet because you don't want to get that stigma in your head or anything. But um, like I said, it's something to get used to. Uh, it's a lot less busy work based. I personally had a lot of trouble in uh, grade school with, you know, just the little minimal worksheets and everything. But you'll find that in college, that's not something that you're going to worry about as much. Uh, obviously, tests and projects count for more, but that's how you're going to learn. And that's, in my unprofessional opinion, the best way to do it. So that's how I would define that. Thank you, Kyle. Our next question. Does the College of Charleston offer tutoring to students or are students expected to source their own tutors? 
So the college in general, um, Courtney again, sorry, I just want to reiterate that. The college does offer tutors. We have the Center for Student Learning, which is located in our library, and there's student tutors who are there who have already taken the courses that you've been in. They can offer you like really good guidance because they've been in your shoes within a semester or two. There's something there's someone that can give you firsthand advice on how to study for something or give you like tips and tricks that helped them on the way. But also for me personally, one of my professors sent out an email to all of his classes and like these are the tutors that we have available and they were just outsourced tutors that were all certified by the college that they all like know can teach you the material and are comfortable with it they're outside of that center for student learning so you do have like a ton of options if you do end up struggling in a course that are going to make it a lot easier great thank you courtney our next question will academic advising assist Will academic advising assist you keep you on track for graduation? Hi, this is Destiny and I can take that one. So I'm Destiny Hawkins, a senior majoring in political science, minoring in English. I'm from Rochester, New York and Greeleyville, South Carolina. And I would definitely say yes, academic advising keeps you on the right track with graduating on time. And once again, everybody has their own time. So don't think four years is what you have to graduate in. Um, you know your track, you know your pace and your advisors will help you stick to that. Um, all you have to do is set up an appointment with them. When you're an incoming freshman, you will first pick up your first set of classes with an advisor. And once you declare your major, you'll be given another advisor. Some majors require academic advising each semester, such as political science, and some do not. And I would recommend that even if they don't, if you feel like you need that extra help to do so. And also to look at, on all, look at our online resources, such as DegreeWorks, which you can do a what if audit, meaning you can see which classes that you'll take will help with your um, major, you can also look at the roadmap on our CFC page and see what classes and will help with what major. Awesome. Thank you, Destiny. Our next question. Have you studied abroad? And if so, how has it supported your academic track at CFC? Hi, so I'll also take this one. So I don't believe any of our student panelists have studied abroad but I can speak a bit on it. So I was planning to study abroad pre-corona, but that's okay. I would definitely say to look at study abroad opportunities and how it can support your academic track is by going on the study abroad trips that are in your defined major. You will have some that have classes in several disciplines um, that you can go abroad for. And once again, talking to your advisor as to which ones can help you stay on track and not get left behind. And if you are in a major where it's kind of difficult to get one, we also have semester, sorry, excuse me, May masters where you can study abroad after the semester is over for the month of May, as well as alternative spring breaks where you can study abroad doing service projects in different countries and areas. So do not knock it. And also don't think just because you're in a particular major, it's not for you. Great, thank you, Destiny. Our next question, are students able to register for their first choice classes? Are freshmen always stuck with the earliest classes of the day? And I can once again <laughs> get this one. So when you're registering for your first set of classes freshman year, um, each class actually, they don't open all of their seats, especially um, first year experience classes, and then some other um, major, excuse me, major classes that you need to take on your general education classes. They do not open all their seats specifically for this. Um, they want to make sure that freshmen have the opportunity to get into those classes that they need, as well as the time. So each class usually has more than one time and not always at 8 a.m., not always the latest. So making sure you look at all of your options, all the times, and um, not being focused and stuck on getting one particular class because there are several classes that can cover each requirement. So having an open mind when you do choose your classes. Great, thank you, Destiny. Our next question, how big are classes? I'll go ahead and touch on that one. Um, our class, the biggest class that I've had was my first year experience. It was my um, within the Honors College, so it was broken down into, I think it was 50 students, but we met into discussion groups the next day that were smaller and a little more activity and discussion based. But the largest class I've had outside of that one was probably 25. So I really feel like whenever I'm in these classes, I'm getting attention that I need and being able to like ask the questions that I want to ask. And your professors are more than willing to like help you outside of that because they don't have 
600 students to worry about per class. So it's really nice to have a class size that's a lot more manageable. Great, thank you, Courtney. Our next question. Since students apply to CFC undeclared, what types of classes do you take until you do declare your major? Hi, I'll answer that one again. Um, so in your first two years, that's just gonna be your general period of um, general education classes. And so coming in from high school, you're gonna have your general math, science, English, and history. But then the college adds on foreign language, social science, and humanities. So all these classes aren't just the classes that you have to take. These are the classes that are gonna help you decide your major for your next, um, your last two years at the college. So I took my first public health class as one of my general education requirements. And that's how I knew that I wanted to be a public health major. So by taking these classes early on as part of your general education, it helps you decide what major fits you best and what you wanna study on in the future. Awesome, thank you, Jack. Our next question. What are some tips for studying and being successful in college? And any of our panelists can take this one. I'll take this one. Um, so my name is Lily Fair. I'm a junior here at the College of Charleston, double majoring in history and international studies with a minor in French. And I'm originally from Waxhaw, North Carolina. Um, so my biggest tip for kind of studying and being successful is just managing your tasks well and being on topic. Time management is crucial in college, not so much like it was in high school. Um, so my freshman year, I didn't have a planner. And I was kind of just running around campus with like a chicken with its head cut off, but sophomore year I kind of buckled down and realized that you need to write down your tasks before you can kind of get them done efficiently. So that's kind of what I've done for the past two years. I also cannot recommend Google Calendar enough. It seriously saved my life and that was like the best way to organize my schedule and get like blocks of studying in. It's just super helpful. That's like my pro tip for that. Awesome. Any other students want to chime in on that one? Great, great advice. Our next question. What are some of the most helpful resources you've taken advantage of to be a to be successful in class and get involved at CFC? So I'll go ahead and take this one and my biggest answer is all of them. <laughs> but you will definitely get many emails as soon as you sign up um, from different offices. They email some of them the entire student body, some within your major, some within your minor. And they'll, um, to actually read those emails, go through it, I would say that personally, the Career Center has helped me get an on-campus job, well, several on-campus jobs, which um, on-campus jobs kind of help with being balancing being a student and as well as a worker. But I'd also say um, going to, we have the Center for Student Learning, using those for tutoring, even before you start falling behind. We have counseling centers, say you're having like, you, everything you're piled up you're stressed out going to the counseling center we have so many people so many places to help um get you in the right mind and the right mode to not only study but be more than successful and then as far as getting involved i'm in several clubs so going to these clubs interest meetings looking on who are connecting what they're about and seeing what like dra draws you in and actually finding out that information and contacting with them that's how you get involved by actually um the work the the, sorry, the message is out there, but you're reading the message and going to it. That's how you really get involved and take advantage of everything that's offered to you. Great. And Thank you, Destiny. This is um, something that's a little bit outside of a little more professional side. We have an involvement fair every fall and every spring, and that is like where all of the clubs on campus have a table set up outside and you're allowed to like walk up and sign a sheet and you're put onto their email list so you can talk to people that you're interested in being involved with. And then they have your contact information so you know when they're gonna meet and so you can like fit that into your schedule and make sure you have the time. But it's also important not to sign up for like 25 clubs because there are only 24 hours in a day. So be careful with that too. Great point, Courtney, thank you. Okay, our next question. Is it common for students to double major or have a major and a minor? If you do that, does it take longer to graduate? Um, I can take that one. So this is Lily. Um, I'm actually a double major and a minor and I am graduating on time, but I would say that I'm not maybe like the normal student. Um, I came in with transfer credits from high school. And so I did have time in my schedule to do that, but it's pretty common. I know a lot of people who have to, a double major or a major and a minor. It just kind of depends on what your academic um, pursuits will be after college. Like if you want to attend more school or if you want to just get a job, it kind of depends on what you want to do, but it doesn't necessarily take longer to graduate. It's really just personal preference. Awesome, thank you, Lily. Our next question, 
Are the classes at the College of Charleston more lecture or discussion based? I think that the college is, uh, has, a, has a good balance between lecture and discussion based courses. And even if you are in a lecture, your professors are still going to pose questions to you throughout the lecture to make sure you're like understanding the material and keeping up with the path that they're going on. And with the discussion based courses, it's usually a little more heavy on the reading side. So you can come in and bring your own information into this and kind of pose your own questions so that you can get the get the opinions of your classmates. And so you guys can kind of have, have a little bit more of a Socratic setup. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Our next question. Is there flexibility when selecting general education requirement courses? Hi, Lily again. Um, so I would say yes. Um, so especially when it comes to like your humanities and social sciences requirements, those are pretty flexible. So if they're if you really are not a big fan of say history, but you love the visual arts, you can take those in response to those instead. Um, or for social sciences, you don't have to take something like political science, you could take uh, other things. But when it comes to like math and sciences, those are pretty like definitive. So you will take a placement test for your math classes. And for our science requirement, we have several different options. So we have biology, chemistry, geology, and astronomy. So that's kind of a good flexibility you have there. And also you get to pick whatever language you want. And we offer so many languages. There's probably, I think, I don't want to give a definitive number, but I there's a lot that you can look up on our websites. Um, but yes. Great. Thank you, Lily. Our next question. What's the most fun and or interesting course you've taken in the at the college so far and what made it the best? Um, so I guess I'll take this one as well. Um, so I actually took a special topics in African history last semester um, and it specialized in ancient Egyptian history, which is was like my favorite class I've ever taken. Um, the professor was like so smart, so knowledgeable. He had all these amazing stories from his time as an archeologist in Egypt that he, his career was over 20 years. Um, it was just a super interesting and engaging project, uh, excuse me, class. And we did a project that was all about mapping um, ancient Egyptian astrology, which was by far one of the most bizarre things I've ever learned about, but also super interesting. Um, so that was just really cool. Awesome, thank you, Lily. Our next question. What does the honors college experience look like in terms of academics? Hey, I'll take that one. Um, so the honors college is about a third of your regular curriculum. And so with that, you're going to have all of your honors requirements fit into it. So your honors requirements will be like an English course, one of your foundation courses and a math. And then we go on to more colloquial based topics. And so what colloquial classes are is professors will truly teach you what they are interested in. For example, right now I'm in a class called Banned Books That Shape the World, and it's taught by the Poet Laureate of South Carolina. So she's taking her interest in teaching students what she loves. Other classes like that is evidence-based medicine. We have a class that combines genetics and geography, and we've even had like a time travel class. And so it's what professors are doing is they're teaching the courses that they want to teach and that they want to show students the opportunities in their own fields. And so with these classes, they have a lower class size. So it's about capped of 15 students. And so you have a one on one um, kind of feeling with your professor and they're more discussion based. So they encourage you to speak up, do group projects and just learn more about what you're interested in and how that affects Charleston and the rest of the world. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. Our next question. What are the best study spots on campus? So I can take that one. Um, Personally, I like studying outside. So whether that's outside of the library, um, in Stern Garden, which is the student center, or in the Cougar Mall. Um, I also like studying inside the library when it gets dark out. I have spent many late nights there. Uh, and um, also the Starbucks in the library, I really enjoy. I mean, it's basically the same place, but it's I don't know, sometimes I enjoy the activity of people around me while I study. Um, for people who are more into STEM majors, there's the School of Math and Science, and then there's the Rita Liddy Hauling Center. Um, and I know my friends love to study there and they have their favorite study spots. Um, but personally, I like the outdoors. Awesome, thank you, Jessica. Our next question. Are classes always in a traditional classroom setting? Do you take field trips in college or have a class outside? 
Uh, I can take that one again. Um, so I would say most of my classes have been in a traditional classroom setting, but that's also because I'm a humanities person. Um, I've taken a couple classes outside when it's nice. Uh, typically the students can persuade the professors to go outside if it's a very sunny day. Um, but I know my friend who's a geology major, she has done many field trips. She's gone to the beach, she's gone to Stono Reserve, uh, she's gone to various other uh, locations on and off the peninsula to get data for labs. Uh, I also know, and you can see it if you're ever in the Cougar Mall, you can see the bio labs, the students coming out and sampling, whether it's the leaves or the dirt. Uh, it's very fun to see them doing that. Uh, but yeah, definitely not every class is a traditional setting. There are some classes that are also like surfing and ice skating uh, that don't necessarily fit into a major, but are still offered here at the college. So there are plenty of opportunities to learn outside of the classroom and on field trips. Great, thank you, Jessica. Our next question, how does the college provide extra support during high stress times like midterm or final exams? Hi, so once again, it's Destiny and I can go ahead and answer this. So the main thing that the college does, it's more so with offices, um, you see that hours will get extended. That works with the tutoring services. Typically those get extended, more appointments made as well as counseling services that get extended because many people do find that they like those um, midterm and final times are high stressors and they need rather than to of course learn more but to get once again back into their mental health that state correct also you'll see many um organizations during midterm time you'll see most organizations hosting events on how to make a stress ball how to do yoga how to relieve stress in an uplifting way as well as during final season um we have a cougar countdown and those are events built around that to get us ready um, for finals, as well as ready to take that break before we come back for the next semester. Great, thank you, Destiny. Our next question, are all seniors required to submit a senior thesis prior to graduation? How and when do you pick a topic for that? And any student can answer that question. I can attempt to answer this question. Um, I would say talk to your advisor and make sure that's within, that's what's in your plan. Um, each major um, has different requirements, especially as a senior. I know many have capstones, some has um, some have excuse me papers, but to talk to your advisor and see what that next step is before graduation. Great, thank you, Destiny. Our next question. What kind of learning disability resources are available to students to be successful in the classroom? And are these available to anyone or is there an application process? And I'll take this one as well. We have a disability service and a, slash a SNAP service on campus. That's what you'll go to. It will be an application process, but anybody can apply. So if whatever you have, you will make sure you have documentation about it. You turn it into their office. Everything is discreet. Um, once you get approved, you will get a P&L, which is this letter just stating that um, you have whichever accommodation that you require. And at the beginning of each semester, you'll give that letter, whether um, via email or in person to your professor and uh, making sure you let them know. Like You don't have to tell them your specifics because those things are private. But as long as you give them that formal letter from SNAP services, you'll be um, granted the opportunity to take those um, necessary steps for you to be successful. They also Great. do programming as well um, beyond the PNL. They do several SNAP programmings and emails for upkeep. Great, thank you, Destiny. Our next question, are internships required for all majors? What opportunities are available to students? Hi, I'll take that one. Internships are not required for all majors, but there's something that the college um, kind of allows its students to do to really get into the community before they graduate. As a public health major, we are required to do an internship or independent study. And one of the main focuses of our public health department is providing global health access to all who need it. And so one of our professors is actually leading an internship to 
um, a different country every year with One World Health to provide clean water access. And so they select a public health major to go and work with a team there in either Uganda or Nicaragua. And it's just an amazing opportunity to do as an undergraduate student. One of my friends actually had an internship at the Federal Reserve over summer, and she was offered a job right out of college because of the internship she got through the college. And so what it does is it gets you into a company and it allows you to do work that's going to be in the field of your major. And most of the time you will walk out with a job after if you do an amazing job. And if I could add on to what Jack said, even if you don't have a required internship for your major, the opportunities are usually sent out in your major's email. They have like internship opportunities. And one of the really exciting ones that was offered for communications and political science students last year, and I guess it was opened up to the entire campus a little bit later in the game, but it was the CBS uh, internship for the Democratic debate that was held in downtown Charleston. And it was a really great way for students from any background to get a really good hands on experience in a city that was already hosting such a great event. And that was probably the highlight of my entire first year because those experiences, even if you don't get credit for them, are still going to be the thing that really shape you as a person and like really help you figure out what you want to do and like continue to grow that passion for it. Great. Thank you so much, Jack and Courtney. All right, guys, we're almost there. Just a few more questions. Our next one is, do most students take or attend summer school at the College of Charleston? Hey, it's Destiny again. And I will not put a number on. I don't know a number, so I won't say whether it's most or not. But I will say summer school is very efficient, especially for those who are taking like having multiple majors or several minors or planning to study abroad where they want to um, make sure they get some credits done before they go away just to make sure they stay on track. So don't um, once again, like not knocking summer school at all, just making sure you look at that. And if it's what you want to do, then most definitely do it because it's definitely helpful in getting you like making keeping you on the right track. Awesome. Thank you, Destiny. Our next question. What has surprised you, good or bad, about academic life at CFC? Um, this is Kyle. I can take this one. Um, well, college is definitely a bit of a culture shock, the transition at least. But I would say the biggest surprise for me was just the general attitude of the professors. They all really understand that you're a human too and generally if you can participate in class and if you can be vocal to them about your needs and if you know something is going wrong that week or like you know just they're generally very understanding and coming out of high school they're going to treat you like an adult they're going to hold you to a higher standard because you are an adult literally um so that i believe is just a great feeling coming out of high school great thank you kyle our next question is there anything you wish you could change about the academic experience you've had so far at the College of Charleston? Hi, this is Lily once again. Um, I think that I wish I would have gotten kind of closer with my professors and kind of learned a little bit more from them outside of cl the classroom, or that being going to office hours, because I know we have some of the most amazing professors in the world, I swear. They are all so knowledgeable about their field, and they're also passionate, and I wish I could have kind of learned a little bit more about like how they got into their fields. Awesome. Thank you, Lily. Our next question. Do students have the same academic advisor all four years and do you select your advisor? Uh, I can take that one. Uh, so for the most part, yes, um, you'll have a general academic advisor or if you're in the honors college, you'll have an honors advisor uh, and they should stick with you for the four years. Depending on your relationship with this advisor, um, you may or may not meet with them every semester, uh, but for your major, you, depending on when you declare your major, you may not have your advisor all four years. You'll have it as soon as you declare your major and it's approved, you'll get an advisor, you'll get assigned an advisor. Um, and if your advisor for some reason is visiting at another college or is leaving or whatever is happening, they're on sabbatical, you will be reassigned most likely to another advisor in the department who can help you out while they're gone. Uh, and do you select your advisor? Sometimes you can. When you are filling out your, um, your major application, you can suggest, say, hey, I would like this professor as an advisor. Uh, personally, one of my academic, my major advisors I selected and I requested 
him um, and it was approved, but you do not necessarily select it. Sometimes it's random, sometimes you can select. Great, thank you, Jessica. I can also add if that's okay. Sure. Um, I just wanted to make a note that if you and your advisor, if you feel like that relationship isn't going well and not effective, that you can request to change. And with that change, you can also um, request like who you'd like to be your new advisor. So you aren't, if you don't, if you feel like you're stuck in that situation, you're not stuck. Great. Thank you, Destiny. Our next question. Is diversity well represented in the classroom setting at the College of Charleston? Um, I can take this one. This is Kyle again. Um, I would say that diversity could definitely be better represented at the college. Um, unfortunately, it's a trend across our whole country, uh, but I, we have a lot of programs in place at the College of Charleston, such as student ambassadors or scholarship programs to embrace diversity and to ensure that students and or students and minorities and POCs in general are comfortable at the college and everything. Thank you, Kyle. All right, we're, we're embarking on our last two questions here. Are courses led mostly by teaching assistants, which are TAs, or are they all professor led? I can hop in on this one. Um, so uh, most of the classes at the College of Charleston are taught by professors. I've actually never had a class taught by a TA. Um, the only thing I can think of is some labs are led by TAs and not necessarily professors. Great, thank you, Lily. All right, students, our last question. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself as a freshman to be successful and enjoy your studies at the college? Um, Kyle here again. Uh, if I could give myself any advice, I would definitely say use your resources and be vocal and recognize that being vocal is one of your resources. You know, like I said before, your professors are there for you. They're there to teach you and they're generally understanding. They see you as an adult and a human being. So as long as you talk to them and you recognize that you have a lot of pieces in place around you to make sure that you succeed, then you're going to do great. You just got to utilize them. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Any other student want to chime in on that quickly? Yeah, I would love to add that the thing I wish I could tell myself as a freshman is that this does go by extremely fast. It's the biggest cliche in the world, but I thought literally yesterday I was a first semester freshman and now I'm like halfway through my sophomore year. So it's just a little bit insane how quickly it goes by. So whenever you're here, really do enjoy it. I know that academics can really seem like the main focus of it. And honestly, you are here to go to school, but at the same time, you're here to make friends and to live your life and to, and to become an adult. So you're gonna learn so much about yourself and about other people and make a lot of the greatest friends you'll ever have within these four years. And so really take advantage of the fact that you're gonna be around people who are your age and who are so excited about the same things that you are, and you'll have a community that's really there to support you. Awesome, great, Courtney. Well, students, thank you so much for your information and for just sharing and being transparent um, to our prospective students and families. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Devin. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you again, students. Um, I can't thank y'all enough for sharing your perspectives. And to our guests and on the call, we are so glad y'all joined us tonight. We know it's a lot to take in, that you're probably Zoomed out, particularly if you're doing virtual school right now, or for our parents and family members working from home that have logged in tonight. We get it, um, but we're so thankful that you took the time to tune in this evening. Uh, please know that we'll have one more virtual open house for the fall um, on November uh, 17th. So stay tuned for, for more information on that date. We're gonna focus on a, a different realm um, of the College of Charleston for that event, so stay tuned. And don't forget to check out our virtual visitor center as you'll see here on the slide shown. Um, great information about getting in touch with your admissions counselor, follow us on social. Uh, we are here for you. With that, we're gonna conclude the event. Have a wonderful evening and we can't wait to hear from you soon. Take care, good night.